Yes? We're good? Okay. All right, let's start over. I was 16 years old when I told my mom that the son she thought she had was, in fact, a daughter in disguise. She wasn't prepared. I was always feminine when I was little, but she had drawn the conclusion that I would simply grow up to be gay, something she was familiar with and accepting of. This was new territory that needed to be explored, and she was frightened for me. She was incredibly supportive and decided it was better to have an alive and mentally healthy daughter than a potentially dead son. That might seem dramatic, but that's the reality for many trans people. According to American organization, the National Center for Transgender Equality, 40% of trans people attempt suicide at some point in their lives. After a few tearful phone calls, my mother was connected with a psychiatrist, we'll call him Dr. R, who was on the verge of retirement. He was mostly based in Victoria, but came to the mainland often. He was going to help connect us to other medical professionals who could help me in my journey. I was eager to get going after feeling terribly about my body for my whole life. You know that if you go through with this, you'll be seen as a deficient human being, right? Dr. R said to me as my mother and I asked questions. He wasn't referring to society's lack of acceptance of trans people, but rather its lack of acceptance of people who can't reproduce, as though giving birth is the end-all be-all of existence. His blunt words did nothing to dissuade me. I got on hormones shortly thereafter and got a part-time job at London Drugs so I could start the long and arduous process of hair removal. We're, we're fortunate to live in a province where some trans-related services are covered, but most aren't. Still, a teenager on a mission can be a remarkable thing and nothing was going to stop me. After a few years, the time came for my first major surgery, facial feminization. This is the process of shaving down certain facial bones that have grown from what some trans women like to refer to as testosterone poisoning. While I, <laughs> while I had started hormones during puberty, it wasn't soon enough to reverse some of the damage that had already been done. Fast forward a few months and the world quite suddenly started seeing me as I saw myself any other 19-year-old woman. Every trans woman requires different medical treatment to relieve gender dysphoria, which is the discordance trans people feel between their gender and birth sex. For the vast majority of us, facial feminization can be a powerful surgery that relieves the chronic dys dysphoria many of us have. The point of facial feminization is to do just that, feminize the face. Attractiveness isn't a guarantee, and once again, the point is to relieve gender dysphoria. However, I was fortunate enough to have results that landed me a modeling contract. For me, as an insecure trans teenager, this was the ultimate validation that I craved. And it might come as a surprise to you, but Vancouver doesn't exactly have a bustling fashion scene. Uh, the goal for many blossoming local models is to travel overseas. I had never been outside of North America, and I dreamt of seeing the world. There was just one thing stopping me. I needed to have sex reassignment surgery. Fortunately, the BC government covers sex reassignment surgery. However, as many of you likely surmise from what I've been telling you, that's only one small aspect of transitioning, and not every trans person opts for it. At any rate, it was something I desperately needed in order to be able to carry on with my life and to truly feel comfortable in my skin. Back in 2010, BC residents hoping to receive sex reassignment surgery, or as some trans people like to call it, gender confirmation surgery, were forced to travel to Montreal to see the world-famous Dr. Brassard. It's not such a bad thing to have to go to a world-class clinic, but having major surgery away from home is never ideal. And my experience with healing from SRS wasn't easy. I was in more pain than is normal for most patients, and I was so swollen I wasn't even able to use the bathroom. I flew home with a catheter inside me, something most patients don't have to deal with. My mother was by my side while I was crying every day. And when we landed back in Vancouver, I had to visit my GP to have the catheter removed. She had zero experience with trans patients and didn't know what to expect. The first words out of her mouth when I was removed my loose-fitting bottoms were, wow, yep, that's a vagina. <laughs> After removing the catheter, she said I'd have to visit the ER if I couldn't go to the washroom. And let me tell you, the pee I took that day was the most glorious pee I've ever taken in my whole life. <laughs> Thank you. The prospect of having to go to a hospital where other doctors surely weren't trained in or familiar with the major surgery I had just had wasn't appealing to me. In fact, it terrified me. Finally, after many months of healing and following a rigorous post-op care schedule, I was ready to travel overseas on my first modeling contract in Istanbul. After that came Beijing. 
It was a time I'll never forget. I was able to spread my wings in foreign countries where nobody knew of my past. It was the first time I felt free. Now that I've told you a condensed version of my life story, you're probably wondering what my actual wishes are for the future of trans healthcare in our province. While BC could be considered a leader in trans healthcare, there are always improvements that could be made, especially because trans healthcare isn't homogenous. We all have different needs. So first off, I hope the government considers covering more trans-related medical services. It's not all about genital surgery. That's an archaic way to think of transitioning. We need to update how we view the bottom line. For many trans people, procedures like facial feminization are as vital and life-saving as gender confirmation surgery. Secondly, we need some form of medical training for GPs and physicians at hospitals. I should have never felt fearful of going to the hospital, fearful of being misunderstood, misgendered, and treated like a science project. It was bad enough that my GP didn't know what to expect from my sex reassignment surgery, so I certainly wasn't going to trust a stranger. That brings me to my next point. At the very least, hospital and clinic staff should be given some kind of sensitivity training. I can't count how many times before I changed my information with MSP that I experienced embarrassing situations with staff who just didn't seem to clue in, forcing me to announce my trans status to the whole waiting room. Finally, even if none of those other things happen, a little empathy goes a long way. We don't choose to transition, we must in order to keep living. Keep in mind many of us are treated poorly by society, especially if we're visibly transgender. If you're treating a trans patient, know that they fought to be who they are and their journey wasn't easy. Thank you. Thank you.